Where are we now? Well, we've been dropped in the wilderness, Kevin. The wilderness of Scotland. It happens to be right next to another distillery, though, called Ballandalla. So we're going to see what we can forage in the locale. In the locale? In the locale. Yes, the locale. That's the right word, isn't it? If you ever want to uh, do business with a bushcrafter that likes his whiskey, he's the man. It's a unique combination, I think. Yes. Okay, I I'm recording now, Paul. I th this is all... First of all, we're matching. I, I, I saw that you had your Bull Moose Patrol shirt on when you were talking to Ray the other day. Yes. And so I, I dug it out of the cupboard because I got one from Scott. Um, I met with Scott last year at the Global Bushcraft Symposium. He was there and he brought a shirt for me, which is very nice. So I think the least I can do is, you know, come out in sympathy with you and wear one. So That's true. I, I've been wearing this like a house coat during the pandemic. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a little smoking jacket. It is. <laughs> Not that I smoke. I've never smoked, but you know. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Uh, you were having some technical difficulties and uh, what was uh, quite funny is that you, you couldn't get a hold of me because I turned my phone off so it wouldn't ring while we were recording. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, I, I won't go through the boring story of technical difficulties, but yeah, I got everything set up. I was like organized. I went to make a, a coffee. I came back. My computer had gone to sleep and it wouldn't turn on again. It just kept sort of cycling and going back to sleep again. So I've had wires out, I've been under the desk, I've disconnected all the external drives in case that was causing a problem. I mean, this is the first time I've used Zoom, so I hope it wasn't me installing the Zoom software that caused the problem. But anyway, we're here now, so um, well, cool. I, are you like this in the wilderness as well? <laughs> Disorganized. <laughs> no. You really need a good sort of locked position. Good firm lunge, hand on knee, back straight, and then you've got that depth to drop it without moving anything else other than your arm and your shoulder. And you want a nice lock at the bottom, like this. Whereas Kevin was all kind of a bit like, woo, woo, everything's <laughs> up and down, woo, got my leg the wrong way around. <laughs> and I'm normally pretty, pretty tech savvy as well. Most people know that I'm you know, we've done lots of podcasts and recorded online and Skype and I'm pretty good with that stuff normally, but just now is the time my computer decided to crap out. Can I say crap? Is that, is that, is that not too impolite for Canadians? In, Can in Canada, we can say crap, yes. Okay, cool. Or, or doo-doo or okay. caca, whatever, yes. Um, yeah. Got my coffee. Okay, I know it's supposed to be a whiskey fireside chat, but... Oh, Cabot Trail. Nice. It's maple syrup and whiskey. I'm going to put it in my coffee because it's earlier here than you. Yeah. Well, whiskey in your coffee is fine. Um, I haven't got much of this left, but it's one of my favorites. It's a oh, Craig yeah. and Moore. That's very nice. And, that, and that's got a significance for us as well because we camped on an island very close to Craig and Moore. Are we there yet? <laughs> yes. Nearly. It's dark, and it's late, and it's cold, and we haven't had whiskey yet, and yet we're in Scotland. <laughs> the haggises are out. <laughs> I'm even afraid of them now. I actually think they're telling the truth. <laughs> and I gotta pee really bad. <laughs> and when we were on the spay, so I, I dug that one out, and I've got my little um, tape. And there's a story behind that as well, which I can tell you as well if you want at some point. So. Listen, so, uh, uh, well, what is the story behind the glass? Um, so this little glass is from Dalhwini, um, the, another Scottish whiskey producer. It's the, if, if I'm correct, it's the highest distillery in Scotland. It's on the, the pass as you come over um, from kind of uh, Blair Athol and that area, and you come up the, the A9, the main road, or the main railway line that way. And Dalwini is that white distillery that's just off to the side of the railway line and, the, and it's up in quite a remote, um, sort of quite an exposed area. But it's a good whiskey and we've had, we've had Dalwini together um, yeah. before. So anyway, this was from a tasting. Cheers, by the way. I should say cheers. cheers. I'm not much of an afternoon drinker, I have to say. It's three o'clock in the afternoon here, but... Why not? It's it's the weekend. It's the weekend when we record. <laughs> We're in a pandemic. <laughs> yeah. Paul, uh, what uh, distilleries are we driving by? 
we've just gone past Abalawa. Before that, we went past Glen Farkless. Um, we could see McAllen over the way. We've gone past Nokando as well, and several others. It's 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 like medicinal, isn't it? Is it? Yeah, that's what I'm calling it. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, um, we got this at a tasting at Dalhwini. Um, this that's I don't know if you can see it says Dalhwini on it. Um, so what we were doing was we were walking across Scotland. We were doing a hike across Scotland from the east across to the west. And it was for um, a friend of mine, Matt. He was getting married. And rather than doing a regular kind of stag do or bucks do or whatever you want to call it, um, for his outdoorsy friends, and you know, there's only a few of us that would want to do this, what he suggested is that we walk across Scotland um, for his pre-marital kind of celebration and not only were we going to walk across Scotland but we were also going to take in the highest peaks in Scotland as as we did this walk so this is a this is I think four or five years ago we did this yeah I think it was 2014 or 2015 around about that time um so anyway so we started up near Aviemore which is near to the spay runs through Aviemore just so you get your bearings and we went up into the Cairngorm Mountains because a couple of the highest mountains in Scotland are the Cairngorms, um, are in the Cairngorm. So there's Ben McDewey, there's Cairngorm itself, there's Ben McDewey there, which are two of the highest mountains. Um, and then we drop down camp and then go up the other side onto this big plateau. There's a couple of high peaks there. Um, and so we, we follow this route through, we drop down, go past Dalhwini, walk along uh, Loch Erich, go up past Ben Alder, and then cross over onto the, the Western mountain ranges, go up into the Grey Corries, finish off on Anachmore, and then onto Ben Nevis, which is the highest, and then we drop down into, into Fort William. That's the plan. So there's nearly 300 peaks in Scotland that are over 3,000 feet, and they're called the Munros because they were first classified by the Victorian mountaineer, Sir Hugh Munro. Uh, but there's only nine that are over 4,000 feet. So the plan was to do this cross, cross Scotland hike and take in all the peaks that were over 4,000 feet, which is about 1,350 meters, something like that in metric. So, um, so yeah, the nine highest peaks in Scotland and walk across Scotland from the east to the west, basically. And so along the way, because it was a buck's do, wasn't like a, you know, we had to we had to have some whiskey. And in fact, Matt wasn't a whiskey drinker before this trip, but we made him drink whiskey at the top of every single of those peaks. Wow! So we took we took whiskey, we decanted it into plastic bottles so it was lighter. We weren't carrying glass bottles, um, and he really didn't like it at first. So we also made him wear a, um, a Jimmy hat at the top as well. You know, one of those hat, <laughs> Scottish hats with the with the kind of ginger hair comes comes out, Not probably maybe a little bit offensive to the Scots, but I've seen Scottish people wearing them anyway. So we made him wear one of those at the top, and ha he had to, you know, take a swig of whiskey. And along the way, we stopped at Dalhwini. But by the time we got to Dalhwini, he was actually getting into it. It was like this: this is okay. I'm getting a taste for this. And we tasted a number of different whiskies at Dalhwini, including Dalhwini's own, but then some of the other distilleries that are owned by the same company. And he really enjoyed those. And the testament to him actually not lying, he wasn't lying, the testament to that was when we got to Fort William at the end of the trip, when we went to a bar and we had some, you know, went to a pub, had some food to eat, he actually wanted to try some more whiskeys from behind the bar. And, you know, he, we didn't force him. He was like, I'd like to try some more. So we had, again, a range of whiskeys at the end in Fort William. So, and we, we each kept one of the tasting glasses from Dalhwini and took it with us for the rest of the trip. And I've still got mine. So <laughs> that's, that's a, well, you, you're making me thirsty then. Like, I, like okay. I, Ah, oh, Balveni, nice. Yeah. Good memories of that place. That's right. The, uh, <laughs> that sounds a lot better than, than my stag uh, years ago. I, I, my buddies took me to a karaoke bar and I had to sing John Denver. I can imagine you doing quite a good job of that there, Kevin. <laughs> what did you think, Rocky Mountain High or something? Something like that. Oh, yeah. man. That's a good trip. That's fantastic. The, uh, well, so 
this is this is Paul Curley. Yeah. This is a bushcraft extraordinaire that can't figure out his computer at home, but well, I guess I guess it keeps keeps with the uh, mythology of being an outdoors person, doesn't it? If you can't use your computer, so <laughs> yeah, it just happens. I, I I've been lucky through this whole Zoom thing that nothing really has gone wrong. So yet, <laughs> yes. Uh, except my mother continues to phone me while I'm on this thing. On where where are you? You haven't told me. Talked to me for a year or th oh, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> all right I, i've got a script i haven't kept to the script this entire time but that's all right uh so i'm gonna start off with the the, the question the ultimate question who what when where got you into wilderness travel wilderness travel um yeah good good question um so i didn't start paddling until i met ray really and we can get on to that so uh, before that my kind of travel wilderness travel was on foot as you might have, have guessed from that previous story i, I also like to hike and, and backpack and i think really when i was in my late teens i kind of started doing a lot of just day hikes and the lake the english lake district is not far from where my parents live and i really started getting into to hiking and going up the hills and um then I wanted to go out for longer and I, I liked camping, but I'd never really done any backpacking. And so this was when I was about 17 or 18. So I kind of, you know, saved up and bought a, a kind of fairly crappy tent and I bought a reasonable rucksack and some decent boots, which I guess are the important things for some, some comfort. And I started doing some, some backpacking uh, trips because I also, I did my A-levels when I was 18. So that's like the end of high school. Um, and then I went to university in Edinburgh. So I was quite close to the Scottish Highlands. I could jump on a train. And so that to me was kind of a natural and fairly inexpensive way of getting out when I was a student um, to go out and do some, some camping trips. And that's really when I first got to know the, the Scottish Highlands. Um, but before that, I guess I'd been interested in more in the, the survival end of outdoor skills because and in some ways that's kind of what I'm known for now is the bushcraft stuff and I grew up in quite a, a, a little remote well, it's not so remote but it's a very small village um in the northeast of England um and I had two or three friends there that that lived in the village and we'd regularly go out and we'd go out and just run around the woods and play and we were always outside you know it was that age before computers before playstations before like there were those little, do you remember those Atari things that looked like they had like false wood panel on the top? A few people had those, but we only ever used those things when it was right, too wet and raining and cold to go outside. Otherwise, we'd be outside riding around on our bikes. And, and so I grew up in a, in a rural area and we'd also lived in North Wales, um, not a million miles away from where Justine was living, but before, and not a million miles away from where Ray lives. Um, I lived there when I was a kid um, but until I was 10, from 5 to 10. So I'd always been in rural areas. I'd always been running around the forest. And so I think it was natural that I kind of got interested in how, how do you do things here? You know, how do you make a shelter? You know, all those sorts of things that we started getting interested in. And so when we were in, in our teens, my dad bought me Lofty Wiseman's SAS Survival Handbook, which... I've still got somewhere, um, it, 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 or books, I'll find it in a minute. But anyway, I've still got the one that I had then. And my friends and I, we, we kind of go through this and go, oh, yeah, let's, let's try this. So we try and make a fire in a particular way, or we try and make a trap. Or... So I was, I'd always been interested in that stuff. And so that was, that was one of my inspirations, really, in terms of people. It was Lofty's book, because there were some kind of quite cool hard skills in there. And, and he covered things like navigation and, and whatnot in there as well. And that led me down the path when I started backpacking, um, starting to pull books from the library and get books on navigation and learn how to navigate properly. So in a lot of ways, I was, I was kind of self-taught to start off with because I, I can't really say that I had an in-person mentor who started to teach me outdoor skills um, other than my parents um, and they're not um, they're not kind of wilderness expeditioners but when we lived in North Wales um, they'd always been keen walkers and when we lived in North Wales we we're always off hiking up in the forest that was directly behind our house 
or they, they took me up Snowdon, which is the highest mountain in Wales, um, when I was seven. And we didn't, there's a little train that goes up from Llanberis. I don't know if you've seen it. It's like, it's got a rack and pinion system on the bottom and it kind of pulls it up a relatively gradual slope on the tourist side of the mountain. Um, and there's a trail that goes alongside that, which a lot of people walk. Um, but we went up the back, one of the back routes that was quite rugged. So that was what they had me doing when I was seven, you know, up these, these rugged ridge route up the back of Snowdon and various stuff like that. So I, I guess that didn't seem abnormal to me, even when I was a kid, just being out in the woods or being out um, in the hills. And so I guess they introduced me to the outdoors. Um, my dad was a keen gardener and you know, so he, he's got a good botanical knowledge. So I guess my interest in plants started then. I remember eating peas out of the pods in the garden when I was a kid. And, you know, he, he also showed me some things which were poisonous and some things which were edible. And I think, you know, that is useful. And I also just think growing up in the countryside, when I started to learn bushcraft more formally, I started doing some classes later on. And I was like, right, I want to learn more about this stuff. Um, having that background of growing up in the countryside having some idea of what the trees and plants were uh, and just having a familiarity and, and being comfortable outdoors that all stood me in good stead for kind of building on that later on so yeah my parents were, were definitely a, a big influence because they just introduced me to the outdoors and um, we were doing outdoor stuff all the time when we were kids uh, particularly when we lived in Wales and then when I was living in the northeast of England, I had this tight little group of friends who were all interested in going out into the woods and building shelters. And we used Lofty's book and some other sources to, to try and learn those things. And then I got into backpacking and I was also mountain bike racing at that point. So I was kind of getting pretty fit, which helped with the backpacking trips as well. Um, and so that that was just kind of that was me up to about 21, you know, when I was at university. I, and then I started getting more into the bushcraft and wild foods and, and that more formally after that. So, yeah, that was kind of my origin story. It's, it's kind of always been there for me, being outdoors and doing stuff outdoors. What did you go to university for? Uh, I did maths. <laughs> I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, I did mathematics at Edinburgh University. Yeah. Lord, that explains a lot, Paul, I'm telling you. <laughs> Well, what made you start uh, start uh, teaching or wanting to teach others the, the wilderness skills? I'm Paul Kirtley from Frontier Bushcraft. In this video, I'd like to talk to you about my choice of axe for winter travel and winter camping in the Northern Forest. Um, well, again, it's, it wasn't something that I suddenly woke up one morning and said, that's what I want to do. So I did mathematics at university and some people find that a bit weird because a lot of people have a very bad relationship with maths because of their experience of it at school and struggle. You know, a lot of people seem to have struggled with maths at school or convinced themselves they're not very good at maths. Um, I, I personally think a lot of people have a bad experience with maths because they have bad teachers. Um, I'm sure it's not the easiest subject to teach to people, but um, I think a lot of people, they're, they're just never shown the relevance of some of it. And for me, I was always interested in figuring things out. So like when I used to, when I used to do mountain bike racing, I used to service my own bike. I used to take it all apart. I used to clean all the ball bearings, the free wheeled, everything, you take it all apart, put it back together again. So I was always interested in how stuff worked and, and the kind of mechanics of things. And, and I guess a lot of the maths I was interested in was the more kind of physical, mechanical end of mathematics, you know, stuff that had applications in the real world or, you know, you modeled the real world. Even things like, you know, bringing it back to you, you guys, you have links, you have snowshoe hairs, and there is a, you get these cycles of the links having lots of food because there's lots of hares, the lynx do well, they have more babies, more of the babies survive, you get more lynx, they eat more hares, then there isn't as much food. And then also for some reason the hares don't seem to do as well. And so you get these cycles of population. You can model that stuff really well with relatively straightforward mathematics. So that type of stuff interested me. So it was always the stuff that was connected to the, the real world and the natural world. 
just what I spotted as I was about to get back in my boat, there's a little skull, a part of a skull, part of a jaw of a beaver. You can see the the teeth there, like little chisels. This is not a very big one. I've I've seen bigger than this. Um, skulls that I found. But that just a little one, two halves there. And the and the continuously growing teeth all the way through. They're like little chisels. <laughs> In terms of my worldview, it kind of fitted fitted well. Um, but I didn't wake up one day and think I want to teach people maths or I want to teach people outdoor skills or, or anything like that. I just had an interest in stuff. Well, I found the portage, um, which is up on the rocks, just up there, as expected on the right. Um, I can actually walk down the dry channel here though, which is more direct to the end. Um, I did think about camping here originally. There is a camp of sorts, sort of cap, like an open spot on the rocks up at the top there. And um, it's okay, but it's in the shade now. Um, although there's a breeze going through, which is good for the bugs. So I did consider it, but then I got down to the end of it and there's, there's a real kind of mess there, um, which put me off, I have to say. And also, you know, for a, a camp that's next to some falls, some rapids this has no moving water and kind of feels dead um, in a slightly morbid sort of way um, feels like the sort of land that the river forgot it's all dried up there's no flow through here you can see yeah, you can see all the sculpting of the rock from the water flow and I'm walking down the channel here of where the water would be. You can see the walls there, I think. Um, which is quite fun, in a way. After I graduated from university, nobody, because I was quite an academic kid, I, was, I mean, I did sports, as I say, I used to race mountain bikes and stuff, but because I did well academically at school, I had always been encouraged, parents and teachers, to go kind of down a an academic route and a professional route, and so, I left university and then it was like, okay, what do I do now? I didn't come from a family with huge amounts of money. So it was like, I've got to go to work. Um, and I was a maths graduate, numerical graduate. So I ended up working in, in the financial industry for a while. Um, so I certainly on leaving university didn't think, right, I'm going to go and be an outdoors instructor. I um, ended up working for a, a, an American insurance company actually at first in their investment department. Um, yeah. Big, well, I, I could do numbers and they, the companies like that like people who could do numbers. So, but the, in the background, what I was always interested in and what I spent all of my vacation time doing was jumping on a train and going to Scotland and doing a backpacking trip on my own or getting a budget flight to Spain and walking in the Pyrenees for 10 days or something. That was the type of stuff that I always did with my, with my uh, spare time. I wasn't like, you know, spending everything I earned. And that was the other thing. I was saving a lot of money. I was reasonably well paid working in financial services. And I never was one of these people who works in financial services who spend, you know, you get these guys who spend all that they earn. They get a lifestyle around what they're doing, you know. Um, whereas I was just like, oh, put it in the bank and, you know, that'll be useful at some point. So, um, as I was doing more and more of these remote backpacking trips, it started making me think back to all of these survival skills I was interested in. You know, how do you purify water? Different ways of lighting fires. What can we eat? Um, what wild foods could be used to supplement backpacking trips? And I, some people might have heard me tell this story before, but I, we were doing it. It was an old university friend of mine. And we were doing a trip in um, in the Pyrenees on the Spanish side of the Pyrenees mountains, which said, for those that don't know the Pyrenees separate France and Spain basically it kind of runs east west across that if you imagine where France is and where Spain is and the Iberian Peninsula the Pyrenees kind of run across in between really nice range of mountains one of my one of my aspirations one day is to to walk the full length it'll t it takes a couple of months to walk from one end to the other and um, I'd like to do it all in one go one maybe maybe for my 50th in a few years time that might be something that I that I'd take some time out to do, that'd be quite good. Um, but anyway, I've done, I've done some trips there and I was doing this trip with Mike, who I knew from university. 
and we were camping in this lovely meadow sort of it wasn't down in the valley it was kind of part way up into the hills but it was like an old alpine meadow probably for grazing because there was an old barn that was derelict and all the slates off the roof had slipped back behind the um behind the barn onto this onto this hillside and where all these slates were it was like a sort of natural rockery and in amongst this there were all these wild strawberries growing and they were all ripe and so i i i was just having a wander around looking at this old building and i went around the back and found these strawberries so i went back grabbed my camping mug and picked these wild strawberries and i must have got like half a liter at least of these little and little wild strawberries are tiny they're not big strawberries like you get in the in the supermarket they're they're small but they're packed with flavor so i had this like little half liter like a pint of of strawberries and i went back to mike and i was super excited i was like look what i found you know these wild strawberries and he was like they don't look like strawberries they're too small you know straw and i'm like no these are wild strawberries he goes are you sure and i'm like yeah i'm sure and i was absolutely sure because that was one of the things my parents had shown me when I was a kid you know we had wild strawberries growing around the outskirts of the garden that we had in North Wales and I used to pick them as a as a little kid so I knew what they were but he wasn't convinced and so I ended up eating this you know punnet of wild strawberries myself but that was one of the things that made me think well what else is there I could be enjoying while I'm out doing these trips, you know, is there other good stuff out here that I don't know about? And so that was one of my motive. You know, if I can kind of think of polarizing moments that were, I want to learn more about that. That was one of them. It's like, that was really cool just to come across that and be able to take advantage. You know, we're eating relatively dehydrated foods and just to have that fresh fruit, it was like fab. Let's, let's see what else we can, we can learn about this. So that was a motivation. Being able to light fires as well was, you know, I, I, I could light a fire, but I wasn't great at it. And I, so there were just some motivations to actually get some training um, in those areas rather than just bumble along and see what I could learn out of books and whatnot. So, and that was, I was still in my sort of early to mid twenties at that point. And that's when I started to seek out somebody to teach. And initially, because we'd had that Lofty Wiseman survival handbook when I was a kid, and there were a few other kind of ex-military people teaching survival skills, but they were all kind of quite team building type things that they were offering. And I actually wanted the, the outdoor skills that they could teach, in, you know, in terms of ed wild edibles and fire lighting and that type of stuff. So long story short, I eventually found out that Ray Mears was teaching um, and I went and did some courses with him. Uh, or uh, him and some of the people who were working for him at the time so that was 2000 2001 2002 that time period um and again long story short i eventually i'd done so many courses with them and then i went and did a, a course up in the arctic in northern sweden with with mears and lars fault that i was offered a job uh, a part-time job helping out on courses back in the uk so that was when I started to make a transition from being somebody who was just learning these skills to somebody that was involved in helping to teach those skills. And that I started doing that in 2003. And again, that was weekends and holidays. A couple of years later, um, I was given the opportunity to, to take a full-time role there. And I was super keen to do that um, because one of the other things that happened, I was still working in kind of offices at that point. And one of the things that happened is my dad took early retirement when he was 57 and he had a minor stroke when he was 59. He just collapsed. What He was in a DIY store one morning, just collapsed with a trans ischemic attack. He was lucky, you know, he didn't lose any physical function. His memory kind of came back and, you know, he's, he, he's, he's 76 next month. So he's, you know, it's nearly 20 years ago now. Um, but that was something that made me think, I don't want to be the guy who sits working in an office for the rest of my life, waiting to retire so I can do the things I want to do. So already at that point, I was thinking, how do I get out of this? You know, I've got some savings. I can go and do some part-time work for some outdoor schools and figure out what I do for the rest of the year, maybe do some writing. I was, I've always been into photography as well. So maybe I can make more of the photography. 
I don't know, but I'm going to make this jump. And then I just happened to be offered a full-time role with Woodlaw, which was Ray Mears's company because I'd been working there part-time anyway. And I was like, yeah, fine. So I, you know, it was a massive pay cut from what I've been earning. And, but I was like, no, this is what I want to do. And I haven't looked back. So that was, you know, 2005. So that was 15 years ago. So that's when I really made the leap to full-time outdoors instructor. I made that decision and I've, that's the route I've taken. They've got a half length handle and a relatively light head. The handle only comes half the way from my fingers to my breastbone here. That makes them eminently portable. They're easy to put into a rucksack. Even a day sack they'll fit into quite nicely. However, in the northern forest, it's my view that a larger axe than this has specific advantages. I've always been an outdoors person. I just happened to be good at maths and economics and stuff. And I did that for a while. But to be honest with you, I could not have set up my company, Frontier Bushcraft, if I hadn't have had the savings that I had from my previous career. Because that allowed me to set, after I left working for Woodlaw for, for five, five or so years full time. So I left at the end of 2000 and I set Frontier Bushcraft up. I was only able to do that because I had savings. That's been the arc um that i've taken so there have been a few real polarizing moments for me um like making the decision to go and learn more formally with the bushcraft skills and um, taking the opportunities that were given to me in terms of being able to take a part-time job and then a full-time job and as i say um seeing what happened with my dad um and like i don't want to not that i don't want to be like my dad because i love my dad but i don't want to be somebody who's waiting for their retirement to do the things I want to do. Let's try and make it work now um, and do the things I want to do. Well, of all the things, so, so uh, you're a teacher, you're a, a podcaster, you have a YouTube channel, you actually guide people on wilderness trips, you're, you take photographs, um, um, you write. What of all those give you the most solace? The most solace? Um, hmm. I think, I think being out there on my own, in if i had to choose one thing like the trip that i did last year or some of the hiking trips that i've done in the past where you know you you're sat there and you you know you've either got into camp and it's lovely you've had a hard day but it's everything's sorted and you just the wind the, the breeze is coming through and the birds are singing or you sat on a hillside somewhere and your tent set up and you've made a brew on your stove and you just drinking that and looking out over a wonderful view or watching the sun go down. I think those moments probably give me, you know, those times where I've just got peace and I'm in, in a wild setting and everything's sorted and I feel at home. Those are the moments that I, that I really cherish. And I, and I guess some of the other things that I do in terms of sharing either those experiences with other people or sharing the skills that allow people to have their own experiences. It's because, you those experiences for myself and so i want to try and enable to get some sense of the same thing i think well isn't uh, traveling in the wilderness uh, uh, alone dangerous <laughs> it's a nice walk in the woods here um just making plenty of noise because <laughs> i'm on my own and uh, you never know where there might be a bear not that i'm particularly worried about bears but I think it's good to make plenty of noise. I'm then into a bunch more rapids and stuff and I don't want to be going down there tonight. It's going to be getting dark. It's almost an Ask Paul Kirtley rant there. A bit of, for those of you that are hankering after those. <laughs> yeah, I just don't like the, I know it sounds a bit wishy-washy, but I just don't feel like the feel of the place. Um, yes and no. Yes and no. Written, I had that written down, Paul. <laughs> and and it's a good it's a it's a good question because a lot of people do think that there are dangers there. And 
almost, I mean, we could get very philosophical and probably talk for about four hours about this, um, but I'll try not to. So putting my maths head on to start off with, right? People are very bad at assessing risks qualitatively. We're really bad at it as human beings because people focus on things in isolation. They focus on things in silos. They don't look at the overall risks in their, in their lives. So, for example, you're going to go and do a canoe trip, whether it's with a partner or on your own, um, and you're getting a shuttle a road shuttle to the trailhead to where you're going to set off on your canoe trip. And then you're getting picked up at the end. You've arranged to get picked up in, I don't know, 14 days or whatever, a bridge or at the end, you know, wherever it is, they're going to come and pick you up and take you back uh, to civilization. And um, the most dangerous part of that trip is the road trip at the beginning and the end statistically that's where you're most likely to die not in the canoe not in a lake not in the rapids not because of bears i mean the, the i mean i talked to cliff well, i had a conversation with cliff jacobson recently on my podcast and he said exactly the same thing as it's like the reason and we all know this the reason that bear attacks make the news is because they don't happen very often yeah yeah Thousands and thousands and thousands of people die every year on the roads around the world. But you don't see that reported in the news. Like, I mean, occasionally on local news, you get like somebody crashed down the road and three people died and what have you, which is always sad. But we just kind of take it for granted that that happens. So when you when you did the Barrens, I mean, that was a quite remote trip in Canada um, and it was quite long. How many days? That was, was nearly two weeks. It wasn't super long, but it was um it was about 200 kilometers it was yeah it was about 10 11 11 12 days something like that yeah well that was uh pretty good sun's just setting there you can see um i boiled four liters of water what's really interesting actually this is catching my attention is the wind there wasn't much of a breeze before but there's something changed with the wind because the next set of rapids that i said that i might have to go down to where there's a 70 meter portage there could be a camp i didn't know all of a sudden i can hear it whereas the whole time i've been here which is about an hour I haven't heard it and literally just five minutes ago as the sun was hitting the horizon something changed with the air um, at one point this was completely mirror calm there's actually ripples on it now so there's something changed with the way that the air is blowing around which is interesting you notice these things when you're on your own so why did you choose to do that alone? Because you've done a lot of trips in Canada with other people like Ray Goodwin and you've got a, a, a clients uh, here as well yeah, I mean, I've done I've done other shorter trips on my own just to kind of go out and go out for a few nights into an into an area just to see what they're what they're like um, in, in the past. But yeah, most of what I've done there has been with Ray or it's been with other people, um, sometimes with groups that we brought along um, or I've done trips with Amanda. We've just done a, a tandem trip on our own. Um, but yeah, this is the lot. This was the longest trip that I that I've done solo in Canada, and it was only only a couple of weeks, which I know isn't long by some people's standards, including yours. Um, but it is quite a remote place. Um, you have to fly in to Family Lake, uh, which is where I started. Um, I did look at doing it from the headwaters, but I just didn't have the time. I think you need about three and a half weeks because the where the headwaters are, you can paddle down into Family Lake and then out. Uh, all the way down to the end to, to Barron's uh, River um, Indian Reserve, which is right on um, Lake Winnipeg. Um, why I chose that was I paddled the blood vein before with um, with Ray and, and a group. And I was thinking about, well, it'd be quite cool to do this on my own. You know, I'm, uh, you know, when I first started coming to Canada, I wouldn't have done a trip like that on my own because I wouldn't have thought I was experienced enough. But having done you know, sections of the Missinibe, Blood Vein, other trips there. Um, 
I thought, yeah, it'd be nice to do something like that. And I thought, oh, maybe I'll, maybe I'll start from the headwaters of the blood vein and do the whole blood vein as well, um, rather than flying into Artery Lake. And then I thought, well, that still doesn't tell me, because I've done the blood vein three times now. I'm like, it still doesn't tell me that I've got the decision-making capability because I kind of remember what some parts of the river are like. So I want to go and do something that's of a similar challenge, but is completely unseen. I mean, it's absolutely pristine. There's nothing here. And um, there's a few cabins, um, but yeah. And I, I've seen one other canoe and that was a pair coming upstream. And that was on my first day. And that was at the top of um, Night Owl uh, Rapids Portage. Um, I didn't get a video or a photo or anything with them. I kind of wish I had now, but um, Jason and Paula, if you're out there, hi. And so I was like, okay, well, what else is around? So north of there's the pigeon, which sounds awesome, but there's more white water on this, like white water canyons and things, which I'm like, okay, well, I'm probably just going to end up portaging around some of that stuff. But if I was with other people, where we could spot each other and do safety and boat rescues and things. Maybe there'd be some stuff there to paddle. It might be more fun to do the pigeon with other people as a group. So I left the pigeon alone and I was like, okay, what's next? Okay, the Barrens is there. That's for, the, so you've got the blood vein, then north of that you've got the pigeon, and then you've got the Barrens, which, and they all, they don't run exactly parallel, but they all run out to like Winnipeg. And I was like, okay, still similar Canadian shield country let's go and do that because it's in a, it's a time frame that I can do. I was due to be doing a trip with, with Ray and some, uh, and a group on the Miss and Ibe in early September. And I thought, right, I'm going to make the time to go out in, in August and do the Barrens before that, leave a bit of time between the two and then do that, do that month and a bit out in, in Canada. So, um, it would have been nice to do a longer trip, but I didn't have any more time than that, to be honest. So I was like, that's, that's achievable. It's a challenge. It's unseen, but in a type of environment that I'd like to test my skills. And so that was, that was what I did. The other thing you might be wondering is why the hell does Kirtley have such a massive coffee pot with him when it's a solo trip? Some of you, maybe you're thinking, well, Kirtley, just camp where you want. I mean, it's a wilderness. It's not even a park. You're on crown land. True. Um, one of the North American species, very similar to the European. This is all quite ledgy, like drop off. Just saw a black bear. Um, don't know what sex, medium size. Yeah. Well, when you're looking at, at skills, uh, Paul, uh, Ray Goodwin, the, the, the uh, gentleman that actually you, you traveled with, I interviewed him last week. I talked to him about the difference of canoe tripping and paddling skills and, and canoe design, whatever, for the UK uh, versus Canada. Um, but I'll ask you something different. What about bushcraft skills for, from the UK to doing the Barrens? Is, is it different? Like the species are different. The, the wild animals are different. The, the dangers are different. Yeah. Um, so on one level, it's very similar because it's northern, it's northern hemisphere. It's the top end of the northern temperate. You're going into the bottom of the boreal. Um, so there are, um, very similar species, you know, you have birch, you have spruce, you have pine, we have birch, we have spruce, we have pine. They're different species, but they're very similar. And from a bushcraft perspective, they're almost identical. The way that you'd use birch bark for fire lighting in Scotland is the same as you'd use birch or Sweden or anything on this side. If you're using betula pendula on this side of the Atlantic, it's the same as using betula paperifera, paperifera on your side of the 
Atlantic. You know, you, you, you light it with a match the same way, you scrape the surface up and light it with a spark the same way, you know. Um, you get horses hoof fungus, Fomus fomentarius over there. We get horses hoof fungus over here. You light that with a spark exactly the same way, wherever you are. Um, you go to a spruce tree for small for fire lighting. Um, however you get your initial flame, whether it's by bow drill or sparks or a match onto birch bark, you want some good small sticks. Spruces are great. So whether you're talking about black spruce or white spruce in your neck of the woods, or Norway spruce over where we are, or even go further west of the west of the Rockies and get Sitka spruce, those properties are the same. But then you've got extra cool stuff like you've got balsam fir, which is, I love balsam fir. You know, I've used it on cut burns and cuts and things as a, as a topical antiseptic and a salve. You know, you, you've got good low, you know, that it's quite a widespread species, but you've got some additional species that are not necessarily the same as us, but there's that kind of, um, there's that band of very similar species in terms of the trees. The forest floor species are somewhat different. There's a, lo there's a lot more variety in what's on the forest floor in Canada compared to Europe. There's, there's an overlap, so you get, I don't know, you get wood anemones and you get types of wood soil and various things, but we don't get, you know, the wild sarsaparillas and the Indian cucumber root and bunch berries and those are very North American species, but yeah. And that's one of the things that I like about traveling and, and applying bushcraft skills and learning about the trees and the plants is that you do get variety. And, um, but there's enough of a similarity that the, the kind of the, the core framework in terms of what skills do you need every day, like fire lighting and natural navigation, you're still in the Northern hemisphere. So, you know, I spend some time in Australia as well. My partner, Amanda's Australian, you go down to Australia and you go for a hike, you have to really think what's the sun telling me about direction because it, it's, it's in a different part of the sky. It moves around the sky in a different way. All the constellations that you can see in both the Northern and Southern hemisphere, if you're out at night, they're all upside down in the South compared to the North. So it's a bit of a, you know, a bit of, bit of a mind explosion to sort of work some of that around you know you're used to seeing the sun move around that way whereas it's going around that way it's going around to the north of you rather than to the south of you um whereas you go to canada it's you're a very similar latitude to where you're at in the uk so your all your frameworks are kind of the same it's just some of the detail in there is different but even looking at uh, the two videos, like the Barren Rivers video that you just put out, and if you finished it, isn't there just one more? Like, I should have, I should have done, but we've had this slightly disruptive thing called coronavirus, which has happened, which meant that we've 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 had a lot of um, reorganizing of courses and trips to do. We've we've we basically, I mean, I should be teaching an axe course at the moment, um, you know, which we can't do. Um, now, strictly speaking, I could probably go and teach it because I can't, you know, people that can't do their work from home are allowed to go and do their work, but none of my students will be allowed to come to the course because <laughs> it's non-essential for them. So um, I could probably go and still teach the course, but I wouldn't have any students. So um, we've had to um, move a lot of our courses. Uh, we, we, we postponed everything April, May and into June. We should have been doing a, a trip in Canada um, in late June, early July uh, on the, in North Saskatchewan. Um, we've moved all of that. Um, so, yeah, there's been a, a, a lot to think about in the last few weeks in terms of um, reorganizing. So, yeah, in March, my intention was to get a bunch of online stuff done, YouTube stuff done. And what we've been dealing with largely is the fallout from, you know, restrictions on movement uh social distancing lockdowns all that kind of stuff and now i'm kind of coming out the other end of having moved all of that and got it all organized to thinking right let's get back with some youtube video editing with footage i've already got and get some more podcasts done and those sorts of things yeah yeah so it's, it's yeah, well, been a bit but my partner christine wanted me to ask you that because she's like where is what what <laughs> But, but you're teaching. You're it's teaching in this online. box. It's in this box here with hard drives on it. So, um, yeah, it, it needs to be edited. So. <laughs> but 
but you, but you are teaching online. You have online courses. You always have, haven't you? I do have online courses. Yeah. Um, the first one. So as as your listeners and viewers will probably have realised, I have a real passion for trees and plants identification and knowing their uses and for me at, at the heart of bushcraft you've kind of got to know that stuff and i mean you know that i mean you you studied forestry you've taught tree identification you, you kind of and sometimes people that know those things take it for granted but when you get students who they can't tell the difference between a birch tree and a beech tree and an alder and a hazel you got and those different trees and once you get past something being wood and you can burn it once you get past that concept like it's wooden it's dead i can set fire to it once you get a little bit more nuanced than that you kind of need to identify the different species and so for me i find i and i found that i was having to spend quite a lot of time teaching people how to identify species so that they could they could locate the right ones for the skills that we wanted um them to do there's no point trying to make a withy out of something that isn't going to twist up so you want willow or you want hazel to twist it up to make a binding for a for a tripod to put over your fire or what have you if you try and do that with birch or sweet chestnut it's probably just going to disintegrate yeah if you want to make cordage you want willow or you want um the inner bark of sweet chestnut or you, you want the right species and so i found that I wanted to create a resource that taught people how to identify trees and plants. But rather than, you know, like we've all got these type of books, Kevin, you know, like that Collins tree guide to most complete field guide to the trees of Britain and Europe. And that's got probably about 1500 species in or, or these types of things, you know, like wildflower books. And I've got all the North American ones as well, you know, like the, the Peterson guides and stuff. The thing is, um, if you're a beginner they're totally overwhelming and it doesn't really give any weight to whether this is common or whether this is unusual as a species particularly here in the in the uk and europe we've got all of our trees and then we've got most of yours as well because they've been introduced yeah so you can walk around where i teach bushcraft and there's Douglas firs and Sitka spruce and lodgepole pines, as well as um, our native, you know, Scots pine and um, Norway spruce, which is not really native to the UK, but it's native to Northwestern Europe. You've got, you know, so you've, so for somebody here trying to learn, it's quite difficult to kind of get a foothold or a handhold. And so one of the online, the first online course I created was a tree and plant identification course. It wasn't a how to light fires, you know, bushcraft, or it was tree and plant ID, but focusing on the species that people need to know for bushcraft and survival. And so rather than kind of going, here's 1500 species, off you go. It's like, okay, which ones do you really need to know? Which ones are common, which ones are widespread, and which ones are useful? Um, and then we can look at uses, whether that's food or fire or cordage or medicine. And also let's learn the poisonous ones as well. So we don't make some mistakes there. Um, and so that's what that course is. And I started that in 2013. And to be honest, I thought it was only going to sell to people who had come on courses with me, had got a, a bit of a toehold on the course because we've been teaching some tree and plant ID as part of the, uh, the general bushcraft course. And then they could go away and spend some more time studying because of course you come and do a course with me for a week in April or June or August. You're only going to see what we can see in terms of ID features that week, you know, whether it's, you know, buds or catkins or leaves or nuts and berries or, or whatever it is. Um, Whereas with an online course, you can study through the year. So I built this thing that was 12 modules and each module goes with each, with each month. Um, thinking that some, that would be a continuation study, if you like, for people who'd done the kind of core bushcraft training with us. In the end, it's turned out to be the other way around. We've, we've had lots more people find out about that course and jump on it because they just want to learn the trees and the plants. And then we get people coming 
off the online course as well as people who find our field courses anyway coming to do the field courses so it's been really good for us and at the moment it's it's really useful I, I normally only open the tree and plant course in late December through to uh, late January early Feb because it's a 12-month course that goes through the seasons but I had quite when we started about uh, three three or four weeks ago when we started to move towards lockdown and then we were like okay nobody can really go anywhere I had a lot of people write to me and say I looked at your course in January I didn't think I'd have the time <laughs> now I have the time <laughs> and then I've also got a, a, a general bushcraft course as well the online elementary uh, which is open all the time um, and okay it's a bit of a plug but people can find all of those all of that information at onlinebushcraftcourses.com so I've got a dedicated um, domain name for those courses and there will be other things there eventually as well when I get around to it but those are the two courses and I've been running online courses for seven years and it's it's nice because you actually you have a you have more of a community around it, it and again that's something I didn't quite expect at first um, people stick around for quite a while and so we've got Facebook groups for both of the courses um, that are only for people who've who've subscribed to the courses and there's a lovely community of people there who help each other out so you get new people come into the online um, tree and plant course they're struggling with some ID and I'll help them of course but then there's guys who've been in been in the course for five years and they've, they've gone from not knowing anything to being really good with their tree and plant ID and they can help the new students as well and they and people share what they're seeing when they're out on their walks and um, if people search on the hashtag tree plant ID on Instagram you'll see all of the all, most I would say 95% of those posts are by people on my online tree and plant course tree plant ID to be honest with you I didn't think that I'd be able to achieve as much as I have with the online stuff because people are skeptical you know they're like can, you can learn bushcraft online what you know, how does that work but I'd say well can you learn and can you learn, have you ever learned anything about bushcraft or the outdoors from a book and they're like yeah okay yeah okay well just think of it like a sort of animated book you know you've got some written material but then you've got video you've got presentations you might have some animations and um, we do webinars so it's like a multimedia book that is like a little reference library that you can learn from and then people go oh, okay yeah that can see the value in that so yeah it's been a really nice thing to do and the only thing for me is I have to try and find a healthy balance for me between doing the outdoor stuff and not getting sucked into being online all the time because if I was just spending all my time doing online stuff then I'm like well this isn't what I got into this for I, you know I for me I need to be outside and I also need to be teaching people you know in person doing teaching the physical skills guiding them on trips as well and and you know getting our hands dirty and so I, I like the balance and students find it super useful to have us deliver both so they can come and do a physical program they can come and do a canoe trip they can go and learn more about tree and plants they can go and work on their um you know physical skills in their own time and you're just going to push the knife down you're not going to try and create any curls to start off with you just want to create a flat surface that you can then work on a bit more. Yeah. Starts getting a bit crowded at the bottom, you can just push them out without chopping them off. Notice I'm working on the outside of my body. Yeah, it's something that I automatically do, but it's here I've got bone and muscle, yeah, but it, on the inside is my femoral artery. I don't want to be working here doing this, yeah, particularly not in a wilderness environment, but in any environment. If you cut your femoral artery badly there's not a lot anybody's going to be able to do for you so work on the outside of your body it's also comfortable you can bring your arm to bear quite nicely there anyway rambling on a bit now i'll have some well, that's more fine. that's cool that's what you do you teach uh now speaking of teaching um has uh, has your uh, your partner um uh, spoons uh uh when going down was it the river d oh the tay Oh, the Tay, the Tay, yeah. yeah. It was the, that's the longest river 
in Scotland, isn't it? Yeah, it is. If you if you start right up at the headwaters, yeah, that's that's longer than the Spey. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. This is. So, as, I would say that's probably my favourite river trip in the UK that I've done the the Tay. Oh, that was awesome. Loved it. Can we do it again? <laughs> Come on. So I'm not, I'm not sure if Spoons still, still works with it. Well, maybe not right now he's not, but, but, uh, but Spoons, I met him a couple times there. And you went down the River Tay with him. Now, did he improve his bannock making abilities? That is powdered milk. Is it? Sorry, I missed that part. <laughs> is that what you try to sleep? <laughs> Should we do the whole lot again? Should we start again? And that's the three things you're talking about? Yeah, yeah, the three, two, one. So three handfuls of flour, two handfuls of milk, and powder, milk. Yeah. and then one of baking powder. But it's not one handful, it's one teaspoon. Okay. Three, two, one bannock. Sorry, it must have been the accent. <laughs> that? I can't understand you. Is that again? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Was there something wrong with his bannock making? No, I just thought I'd, I would say that because <laughs> that would just piss him off. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, you, you met him at the Canoe Symposium, didn't you? Was that the first time you met him? Yeah, and we were doing some bread making and stuff then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, notice how they haven't pointed at this man back here. here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, they call me the good looking one out of the team, but you know. <laughs> backbone of frontier and everything <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, his baking was always pretty decent actually he likes to eat so his his, his baking is good yeah yeah yeah, yeah no I, was, I like taking the piss out of him so <laughs> 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 that looked like an amazing trip though I, I, totally different than the barons in canada for sure right uh yeah but... well the big the, the big challenge that we had on that trip was we I wanted to start as close to the watershed as I could and go all the way down. Um, and so there are a number of tributaries that flow into the Tay system. And we started up on one of the main ones um, right over. There's a, it's actually on the West Highland Way. So there's a, there's a hiking route that goes from just north of Glasgow to Fort William all the way up the west side of Scotland and it goes through a place called Crean Larich and Crean Larich is also where we started this trip so even though the river flows out into the North Sea uh, it, and it flows out on the east coast of the of the UK we started over really quite far west that's how far west the the watershed is and so we started and we came down the river a short distance on the river Fillan and then into Loch Dochart and it's that's where we camped if you've watched that video there's a video on my youtube channel of that trip um there's a little lock there with an old castle on it and we we camped there it was a bit spooky but it was it's was quite a cool place to camp um but that first bit of river to loch docker there was hardly any water in it and so we were like we'd driven all day um, we'd done the shuttle, we'd left the vehicle at the end, we got there, but it was probably about an hour before dark when we got there. And that was fine because it's completely flat, several kilometers of water into this small lake. But there were all these sandbanks and shallow sections that you just couldn't see as it was getting dark. So we had to kind of work our way down this little um, tributary into the loch. And that then continued on until we got to the actual main Loch Tay, which is where a lot of people start the trip. We had a lot of shallow water.
there were two things that led to that. There was very little snow over the previous winter because we did it in May. So there should have been a lot of snow melt. And um, there was no rain leading up to that, even in the west of Scotland. So it was really dry and there was not a lot of water coming into those tributaries that go down into, into Loch Tay. And we had a headwind. The prevailing wind in Scotland is west, you know, in the UK normally is westerly. It's sometimes northwesterly, sometimes southwesterly, but it's typically westerly. We had an easterly the whole trip and we were traveling from west to east. Spoons, tell me about your um, cigar moment yesterday. Oh, my, I needed the Hamlet moment yesterday. I just sat in the boat and it was a proper doom, <laughs> doom moment. It was, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I could have done with, a, done with a big fat Hamlet cigar, but we got through it. Sometimes you just need to have five minutes, have a word for yourself. Say, we're British and we won't bloody well give up either. So, so we had no water and a headwind. <laughs> so we got off to quite a slow start, which then put our, where we planned to camp, that threw out our kind of uh, routine in terms of, okay, we'll camp there and then we'll do that bit and we'll camp there. That kind of got thrown off in the first two days until we got into Loch Tay when, you know, there's a huge amount of water there, which then flows out into the rest of the river system. Um, we, we struggled with lack of water. And so we're doing a lot of lining and, and whatnot. And then, of course, we had the headwind on the loch. Um, but it was a great trip. It was, it was fantastic. And then we got into the river proper, as it were, that flows out of Loch Tay. <laughs> Um, and then we're down some really nice sections and yeah, it's, it's a lovely river. And we had hoped to do the tidal section at the end. There's quite a big tidal estuary section once you get to Perth. Um, but we chewed up so much time at the beginning of the trip. We didn't really have, have the time to do that because we would have had to wait around. You can't do it with a headwind because you've got a lot, you've got to, you've got to time it so that as the tide changes, you go out along the estuary as the water is going, there's the tides going out yeah. before it starts coming back in again. Um, and you've only got a certain time window to do that. And so if you've got a headwind trying to cover that distance, um, not to mention the issues with wind over tide where you've got more water moving one way and the wind coming the other way where you build up waves, we were just like, no, we're stopping in Perth. If we'd had more time to wait for the wind to change, we could have waited in Perth for a few days, but we just, that's where most people stop anyway. So it was a, it was a great trip. And it's one of, my, one of my favorite UK trips in the last few years, that one, it was, it was great. Back to the script here, Paul. I got two questions uh, left for you. Um, very important ones. Mm -hmm. First one, very, very important. What is your favorite Monty Python scene? Favorite Monty Python scene? I, I, could, be, I could be really cliched and say the dead parrot one, but um, I really like the one where he goes in and, and asks for an argument where he wants to, he, have you, do you know that one? And he was like, I'd like an argument, please. And he goes, no, you wouldn't. <laughs> There's just the outright stupidity of some of those things is, is fantastic. Yeah. Why I'm asking that question is uh, um, when I went down the spade with you, I, I really didn't know you. I kind of knew you of you and everything else. And, uh, and it, what, even watching this interview, um, yeah, you had that math, science, serious, uh, organized look. And you are very organized. If you ever go on a trip with this man, do not touch his kit. 
<laughs> okay, no way do you cut, touch any of his kit. You just stay away from it. Yeah, his dirt bolts are a lot more colorful than ours. Have you noticed that? It's a bit sort of gaudy and garish. We got the green boats. We got the green boats. We're blending in with nature. Whereas we've got the gaudy gang over there with their garish, almost uncouth colors. We're the bushcraft people. They can't see us. All right, the other question, which is more important. All right, uh, you're writing a book? Is that, you just sent me a message uh, last night about that. Well, you were asking me what projects were in the, in the offing, yeah? And um, that's one of them. So, um, yeah, I was approached to write a book um, based on one of the courses that I teach. And it hasn't quite ended up being the totality of everything that's in that course it's a bit more of a distillation of some key parts of that course and some other things but it's basically a course on axe skills and camp and woodland campcraft that's that's what the, the book is about so um not quite enough room to put as many photos in it as ray's book but i tried my hardest to get as many illustrations in it as possible um so yeah it's that's I finished my work on it. Um, I wrote a lot. There were a lot of photos. I had to cut a good amount of the text um, from what I wrote initially um, and, and also some of the photos. But what we've ended up with is a really nice, um, high quality uh, piece of work, I think. It's now, it's gone through the editing stage. It's now with a designer. So I'm waiting for PDFs of the design to come back for me to check over to make sure all the photo captions are right you know they've got the right captions on the right photos and that type of thing so yeah so i'm i i think that will be published it'll be printed later in the year i'm not again you know everything's a little bit off kilter at the moment isn't it with what's happening and what what people can still do and what people can't do and um but yeah i think in terms of what's happening in the immediate future in terms of the design work and editing and everything that's all going forwards as per the original schedule and hopefully it's printed later in the year so that's fantastic what's the title it is wilderness axe skills and woodland capcraft <laughs> says what it does on the tin <laughs> cheers to that cheers <laughs> okay well thanks a lot paul for the, the interview uh hope we get out on trip soon and hope all this ends so we can actually travel to do that yeah absolutely and as we've been saying since the spay, I really need to get over there and do a trip with you at some point. Yeah, because I'm going to get you terrified of bears just like you had me terrified of haggis. Haggis. <laughs> well, I'm still not sure you're taking this whole haggis thing seriously. Have you ever seen a, a wolf take down a bison you know, on those natural history documentaries where do they just get hold of the leg? take the animal down even though they're much bigger it's the same with a haggis taking a person they just get you by the ankle and another one gets and they just take you down you don't need to watch out